Hello and welcome to the Bath Studio School with Becky Turgood, Hal Wilson and me, Albie Kronikowski. We are joined by one of the world's foremost underwater cameramen, Michael Pitt. Um, so Michael, tell us, how did you get into the profession? Well, good morning to you. Um, I'm going to give you two versions, the long version and the short version, but really I knew when I was seven years old that I wanted to work underwater. And the reason I knew that was because I'd been taken on holiday to Denmark by my parents because my father was in the Air Force and I borrowed a mask and snorkel off a German boy who I was playing with on the beach uh, this is in the Baltic and uh, I, when I, as soon as I put my head under the water that was it, I had made my mind up and I never changed my mind what did change my mind was when I went to school I came out with no qualifications and I joined the army and it was the army that actually helped me get going because uh, when I was in the army, I could go sports diving. So I wasn't a military diver, I was, but I was going. It was just the early days of the British Tobacco Club, so you could go diving. So um, and that reinforced my passion to become something to do with the sea. But um, as things work out in your life, I had an apprenticeship. I served an apprenticeship of the um, army as a, an aircraft technician and I ended up working in the Middle East and it was whilst I was in the Middle East that I had the ability to dive in the Red Sea and then I was in my mid-twenties and um, I bought my first underwater housing which was, I was shooting stills, it was a little Kodak Instamatic and of course you have to cast your minds back this was the late seventies and it was still shooting on film the new sort of film didn't really pan out in television until sort of the early two thousands but um, shooting on film is a diff very different medium to shooting on, uh, on when you're shooting digitally. But Because uh, you never know how it's going to turn out. You, you never know how it's going to turn out, and I had so many problems. And on the, this little housing I bought um, was always malfunctioning. So it was, um, you, had a sort of a, you had to have a winder, which uh, you press, and also you use flash bulbs. So the flash bulbs you carried in a, in a bag. <laughs> And of course, these sort of things you work out, and uh, the flash bulbs have got air inside, so mm -hmm. of course they float. So I'd have a, this bag of bulbs floating. You screw the bulb in. It sounds in. like you had to carry a lot of equipment with you. Well, it wasn't too bad. It was just it was quite small, but um, the this housing was um, positively buoyant, so it was uh, it would just float. So it would float on my wrist. Oh. And on the fourth dive, I was swimming along in this place called uh, the Canyon in the Red Sea place called um, near Nueva and it was a most amazing sort of narrow channel chasm and I was of course I was thinking back to it and uh, I got so frustrated with the camera because it wasn't winding on I just left it. I thought I'm gonna enjoy the dive and then I suddenly noticed my camera instead of floating was actually sink was actually oh. sitting under my arm and full of water and that's when I sort of thought well I've got to go up a step and so I bought my first semi-professional housing. It wasn't professional, but it was seriously amateur. It was a, an Eichelite for a movie camera. And um, that's when I started making my first little Super 8 millimeter films. And, um, and then the rest is sort of that's what's where I am now. Mm, interesting. So you, did you start making them kind of as a hobby before you kind of wanted to get into the work? or? Yes. The transition from my work as an aircraft technician into the world of filmmaking was quite a big jump. Mm. I mean, a what's changed so much now is when I when I first bought my first Ariflex camera yeah. uh, to get into the business because in those days when the, the, the world of the freelance world was very tough, and it still is. It's I think it's even harder. But the um, my camera was an Ari SR2, which is 16 millimeter. Now that camera, in when I bought it in 1985, and I bought two lenses, two magazines, the camera, and um, an underwater housing. Now that was 28,000 pounds in 1985. The flat where I lived in Bath, <laughs> below me was going on the market for 27,000. <laughs> so that is the difference. So now you can go out and buy a very good camera for 20, 30,000 pounds, but you can't buy a flat for that. Yeah. <laughs> no, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's changed. So that's because the world of film, in comparative, film cameras were so expensive. You know, it's a mechanical system. 
Um, and so that's the big difference. But what actually happened was, the big change was, because when I was working in the Red Sea, I came back to the UK um, and I realised I wanted to make the sea my life. And to do that, I decided to become a commercial diver. So I was 28, 29 years old. I went on a commercial diving course down in Plymouth that was 12 weeks, and I did a few other weeks of training. Went out to the North Sea. I spent five years, as a five, six years as a commercial diver, working in the Arabian Gulf, uh, the North Sea, and West Africa. And whilst I was in West Africa, with my old camera, I hadn't bought the Ariflex then, with the mm -hmm. old camera, the Super 8, over the course of a year, I made a film, and it was called The Artificial Reef. So okay. I was shooting it on Super 8, um, I edited it myself, and it was about the day-to-day -day life of a commercial diver working in the oil industry, but on a platform 20 miles offshore in the uh, Gulf of Benin. Now, most people's ideas of oil rigs are, they're these big rusting structures, the pollutant, the high, you know, all the rest of it, but we need them. Uh, but what really hit me was, unlike diving in the North Sea mm -hmm. or diving in the Arabian Gulf, where I was working on new platforms which are clean, these plat platforms have been in for quite a few years, but as soon as you put your head underwater, they're completely covered in coral and they're surrounded by fish and it just blew me away. And that was the subject for my film. So that film, The Artificial Reef, which I then entered into a film festival, I was then contacted by one of the judges who worked at Thames Television and he said to me, are you a professional cameraman? I said, no, but I'm a professional diver. Um, but he said, I'm very happy to tell you, you've won the competition. Oh, wow. Now, he also sent the film to a company called Survival Anglia, which used to make wildlife films, Anglia Television. Did any of this lead to your work with the BBC? Yes, but that was my big break because I was invited up to London and they sat me down like I'm sitting with you now and they said, you can, we'd like you to work on a film for us, but you can't use that camera. You'll need to get an mm -hmm. Ariflex or an Arton. Mm -hmm. So that was the Did they provide change. you with any money or you had to do no. it out of order? <laughs> no money. I no. borrowed money from my father. I had my savings. So the real dedication for Yeah, you had to say, this is it. And so instead of buying a flat, I bought <laughs> a camera. a camera. So to start. So mm -hmm. well, that's what you've got to do sometimes. Obviously, you and Sir David Attenborough are a fine team working together. Can you tell us a bit about your work together? Um, I first, I've worked on many Attenborough series, but the first time I worked with him in the field was in Sumatra, uh, in northwest Sumatra, and I was working on a series called Private Life of Plants. Now, the Plants series was a series that everybody said you couldn't make. Because what do plants do? They sit there. And don't do very much, do they? <laughs> Make it more interesting. But it was a complete, complete revelation for me, and I'd been working on sequences which didn't involve Sir David. I mean, he on a one-hour program, he will make say six appearances mm -hmm. throughout that, throughout throughout the program. But you hear his voice. But he's the link. He's the thread right mm -hmm. through the series, through the through the, that program and the series, the six-part series, and. Um, but this was the first time I'd been asked. I was based in Hong Kong. He was working in Australia. And the sound recordist and the producer were flying from London. And so I flew in from Hong Kong into uh, Jakarta. And David Attenborough was flying in from Australia. Oh. But I had a two-hour wait. And I was waiting in this little cafe. Well, you were excited by his visit. I was. And I was very, <laughs> also quite intimidated because... You know, this is, to me, he is the man. You know, he is, no, he is the sort of ultimate, um, most professional presenter you could ever work with. Do you feel like you've been inspired by him? Absolutely. He's, it's not just his presenting skills, it's his knowledge, which a lot of presenters are very good presenters, but they don't have the in-depth knowledge as he does. He does. He can go outside and pick a rock up and tell yeah. you about that rock where it's come from, how it's been formed, how many millions of years ago. That's the sort of person he is. So, um, but anyway, I was waiting for his flight to come in. I was with my Indonesian fixer. Um, this was in the days of smoking. He, ch he was a chain smoker. I was just sitting there and just smoking <laughs> his Indonesian cigarettes. And then I just noticed down the corridor this figure coming towards me wearing uh, beige trousers <laughs> and a blue shirt. And I knew from 50 yards away it was David Attenborough coming towards <laughs> yeah. me. 
So I immediately got up and I went towards him and I'd been thinking what I should say. He just got his knighthood. So I thought, should I say Sir David or is it Sir Attenborough? <laughs> Sir David Attenborough. <laughs> and I walked up towards him and I said, it's an honour to meet you, Sir David. And I put my hand out and he said to me, Michael, the honour is mine. <laughs> oh. He said, I've always wanted to meet you. You're one of the team. You're a great, you know, what you do. And straight away he takes... a thrilling the, moment when you... When yeah, that I mean, he takes the wind out of your sails. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and then I spent, you know, the next couple of weeks in the forest with him. And we were looking for a plant called Amorphophallus titanum, the Titan Aram, which is the huge plant which takes a thousand days to flower. And wow. when it flowers, it flowers for two days and then it dies. All that it's time. the most incredible thing <laughs> you've ever seen in your life. But this plant... Although it's not rare, the chances of finding it in flower in a rainforest are very rare. So we had about 25, 30 trackers working in the forest for us. And we would go out each day with the cameras, tripod, all the kit, trudging through the forest in the rain, in the sun, in the heat, in the humidity. And it was about day five or day six. We'd seen dying plants. We'd seen plants. But that's that had, not what you wanted. No, we wanted <laughs> one that had just broken out of flower. And I, on this particular day, he was in front of me. He was carrying my tripod, and uh, I was behind. It had the camera in the rucksack with all the lenses. And um, there's a couple of people in front of us. And I heard this shouting. It was raining, and I got to this sort of top of this little hill in the forest. And I looked down, and he was in front of me, and he didn't even look at me. He just said. <laughs> Michael, you were looking at one of the natural wonders of the world. Is that what you were looking yeah, for? Yeah, and my hair just stood up. <laughs> because I looked at it down there, and when he, a man like that says that sort of thing, you, you know want it's be... true. Mm. And we spent the next two days filming the plant before it died. Um, and it's getting the sink piece in that course. And I've read articles that he's written in The Telegraph and other um, in a book about his five greatest sequences, and that was one of them. So I'm very honoured. Well, congratulations on winning the two Emmys Awards on the two series for David Attenborough. It was it's a good video. Well, it was quite amazing going yeah. to Hollywood. To get the <laughs> oh, was yeah. it all the way? Yeah. Yeah, to go to Hollywood. Yeah, to wow. get it. So, uh, nice. Quite amazing. Um, as well as filming, photography is another one of your hobbies. What made you fall in love with photography? Um, people often ask me that question. <laughs> it's it's when your your work is your passion as it is for me. I mean, I love filming. I love making films. I love helping people make films. I can, it, it doesn't matter what you're doing. It's, if I'm filming underwater or I'm filming a film, I've just done a film recently, which took me four years to make, about an artist and his love of Dorset. And it doesn't matter what sort of film you're making, it's the passion you put behind it and putting sequences together and how it all works. So that's my work. My hobby, if you like, is photography because it's a sort of a. You think, ah, oh, you know, you know, it's sort of. You just want to capture a moment. A capture a moment, yeah. And so I love taking pictures, um, but I don't, I don't. I don't get paid by taking pictures. I get paid by. Do you ever get asked by people to do like work? Occasionally, for, you know. I've been asked to do it occasionally, or I, I have images in in two libraries, um, which make a bit of money, but you know, mm. it's not a big deal. Um, but I, I do like taking pictures. Do you prefer shooting on land or underwater? Um, I probably, I love the challenge of diving. I love the challenge of, last year I was working on a shipwreck on the Goodwin Sands, which, a uh, Dutch East Indiaman, which sank in 1739, the Roosevelt. It's a protected wreck, nobody can dive on it. But even if you could dive on it, it's still a very difficult place to go to because it's three and a half miles or four miles offshore. Uh, you've got very strong currents, hardly any visibility. Um, the di I was wearing a helmet, I was on an umbilical, I was in a diving <coughs> bell, had to go down. But you've got a camera, you've got limited vision, you've got very limited vision. You're down there, you walk into the current, it's black, there's no light. You've got, um, you've got a small light on your helmet, on top of your helmet. So, and to get images or any footage in those sorts of situations is a real challenge. And, you know, I'm not just saying it, it's not for everybody, but that's what I love doing. I love that, 
You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what's happening and what I'm going to see because I got onto the wreck. And you have to bear in mind, 300 people died on that wreck. Mm. And although there's no signs of that, of course, it's long gone. It, it was 1739. But you think of what happened that night. It went down. And that and the archaeology that's right there in front of you. And at one moment, I just happened to glance down and I saw this lump on the seabed. I picked it up in my hand and I had 18 silver Spanish dollars in my hand. <laughs> just <laughs> stuck together in a big lump. And when I came up, that was one of the archaeologists said, well, Michael, they're about 800 pounds each. You had, you Did you have to out. hand it in to someone? I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> I'd like to put it in my pocket. Yeah. I actually did put it in my pocket to keep look after it because yeah. otherwise I've a, I have history. cameras in my hand. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so you you also film from the air sometimes as well. Um, yes, I do. How, how does that compare? Well, what's changed, as you know, you all know this now. Drones have come in mm. big time, yeah. and um, they've sort of taken over really in many ways, but. Um, I worked on a series called Wild Caribbean. Mm. I was the principal cameraman. That was a three-part series for the BBC, and uh, so I was shooting underwater, on land, and in the air. Mm. So I was covering all bases. Um, there are specialist cameramen out there that just solely do that. But I had five days of filming in a Cessna, small Cessna. So I had a wing-mounted camera. So I have a, an Ariflex on the wing. So it's forward facing. Was this the first time you're doing this or? Oh no, no, this is, I've been doing it for a while. But one of the, um, I was working in Ecuador um, and Honduras. So we were looking at the Central American coast and Honduras, of course, um, it's where the um, Mosquito Coast book was written. And based on where, um, God, I'm, just, I'm trying to get the name of the actor now who <laughs> starred in it, um, Harrison Ford. Oh, yeah. He oh, played this father of this family, and he took his family to the Mosquito Coast. It's not called the Mosquito Coast because of the mosquitoes. It's called the Mosquito Coast because of the Indians. It's the Mosquito oh, yeah, yeah. Indians. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called the Mosquito Coast. So this coastline I'd always wanted to go and have a look at. And seeing it from the air, because you're in a very, you can't believe it, you're about four hour flight from Miami in a, on a jet plane, but in the Gulf of Mexico, but the contrast between, say, Miami and this stretch of coast, which just goes on and on and on, mm -hmm. you couldn't get it started because it's just so wild. Mm. And um, flying low over the coast with the Cessna, so I had the forward facing camera, I've got a video assist. So I can see what I'm shooting. Now I wasn't shooting on, I wasn't shooting digitally. I was shooting on film. So I've got a 10 minute load of film <laughs> in that camera, but I'm shooting at 50 frames a second. Which Did means you feel got, scared when you're shooting this, or you were like? You have to make every shot count. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's the one Tricky thing I've learned is the change now is if you come from the school of film, like I came from the school of film, where a roll of film was 100 pounds. This is going back 30 mm. years, yeah, you have 100 to make pounds, every there's a lot shot. of money. And then 100 pounds to process it <laughs> oh, wow. for 10 minutes. Yeah. Whereas now you can just, just shoot and shoot free. and shoot. shoot. Mm. So, every, so the discipline came from thinking, and when I was just shooting my own little promos and everything cost so much, so you had to be so careful how you used it. Um, but now, of course, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't want to go back to. Do film. you still use your film camera, or is it all more digital now? It's all in a box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, you never uh, use it for just hobby. I have or? a Hasselblad, mm. and you ask about the thrill of photographing from the air. Yeah. If I was taking stills from the air, I would only ever use medium format mm. because it was such high quality. And using a Zeiss lens, you get twelve shots basically. So, and filming, so I'd have the forward facing camera, I'd get the pilot to go around once more, I had the back door off so I could climb into the mm -hmm. back. Mm. And then I could get um, a clear shot out the back of the aircraft. So, but with a Hasselblad, you can't really, because everything's reversed. Yeah, you can't really. You can, you, it's, when you, it's very confusing on the viewfinder. So, um, but you wait, so you, you look at the shot coming up, and you can see it out there, you left your eye, and you dial in your polarizer, you, everything's ready, and then you wait for that moment, and then you bang, mm. press the button, and by the time you've rewound, <laughs> you might get a second shot, but you know, uh, generally you get the one go. 
but it's that one go is so worth it. Yeah. Your job comes with risks. Did you have any bad experiences with? Because I've heard about the crocodile um, experience. Do you mind telling us about that? Yeah, I with filmmaking, um, especially natural history filmmaking. You go to some pretty you know wild places, and I've had several close encounters. The worst encounter possibly was um, getting a fever in the Philippines. I got a 106 mm. degree fever and I was seriously, seriously ill. Sorry, 104. 106 you'd be dead. 104. <laughs> wow. um, was this due to your work or is it just... I just got something. I was either mosquito born. They thought it was dengue. I, they still didn't find out what was wrong. They flew me, had to fly me back to Hong Kong. Um, I lost a stone in weight. I was very, very weak. It took me ages to get over it. And um, But in terms of, so that's the unseen <coughs> that can get you. Um, probably the most dangerous encounter I've had with a wild animal was with a crocodile. And that was in the um, Okavanga in Botswana. And I'd gone out there with um, the BBC to shoot this uh, first program called Swimming with Crocodiles and I was with Ben Fogel although Ben Fogel wasn't in the water with me when it happened but um, I was very apprehensive about doing the shoot um, but I was assured by this expert that in cold you dive because you dive in the June or July in the South African winter, because it's there, because you know mm -hmm. below the it's equator, opposite. and so the water temperature has dropped. It was cold. Um, the diving wasn't a problem. It was seven, eight, nine meters in the river depth. Quite a deep river. It's quite fast flowing. Visibility, I can see from here to you. Mm. Um, but on this one occasion, it was day four. Um, this female crocodile was on the bank. Mm. She was about ten foot. And I hadn't even seen her, so I had my back to the bow, and I had all my diving kit on. The big thing about crocs is, when they go in the water, they go and hide. Mm -hmm. And so they have a hidey hole on the bank. They don't like being disturbed. Some of the bigger crocs, I mean, there were crocodiles there five metres. And I, I looked at these things, I thought, there's no way I'm getting in the water. <laughs> and then I seriously meant it, I just thought, this is... You know, and even the guy, the expert I was with, he said, oh, we'll give this one a birth. Yeah. Um, but this particular female, he knew this female. He said, I've been with her before. Um, so, anyway, we pulled into the riverbank. He said, get in, get in. So we rolled in, and I drove straight to the bottom. So I sort myself out. So you get the camera ready, your buoyancy's all sorted, tuck yourself in. And then we were upstream, so we're going to drift back down on her. Now, the big thing is about a croc is they can face into current, they'll swim into current. Um, I'm swimming down to her, so I've got the current pushing me down. So, but I'm also filming, waiting for the, we had a scientist who we were working with, a guy called Adam Britton. So he was gonna be the on-stage talent. Oh yeah. So I had to film him coming down. So I've got to reverse, so I've got to go down the river backwards. So I'm, I'm oh. lighting, and I don't normally do this, I don't ever have lights on the camera unless mm -hmm. I'm shooting macro, uh, but I normally have a lighting assistant with me underwater. But it's so complicated because in a fast-flowing river, you're kicking up sediment. It's hard to go back, like and the then to gauge. There, I have had guys that could do that, but it was easier for me. And also, lighting a full face mask, you've got to get the light to go right into the eyes, mm -hmm. so I can see their face. Because generally, with a help, with a mask on, you you're all in shadows. You can't see the detail. So um, I was going down backwards, and of course I've always got my eye over my shoulder, I look behind me, because the croc's going to be sitting facing the current, and a crocodile, look, his, their eyes, they look up, so they're looking up towards the surface of the river, and anything that goes over the top, that's potential prey, so mm -hmm. they'll bite it. Now, um, we, anyway, we got down without any mishap, and I tucked in under this big mud bank, and the guy I was with, um, this he was, I mean, he was he, um, fearless, you know, he got up, and this local Botswana guy, he went up onto the river bank. Now, I was looking up towards the bank where he'd gone. I could see his fins going up into the mm -hmm. undergrowth. 
and the sun was coming straight into my eyes. Now I've got a full face mask on so I can talk to surfers and talk to the divers. So it's better, but it's very- It sounds very... like there's so many things going oh, on yeah. at one time. There's so much going on. <laughs> so you, you get yourself all sorted and tucked in under the mud. And I thought, right, I'm ready for this croc. If it's gonna come out, it might come out fast. And I, well, you know, so you put everything, just instinctively, you don't want your fingers out, you want everything tucked in. Um, and I, so I was just talking to surface and I was looking up, so I, I could see his fins going in. And then I sort of thought, ah, oh, where is, where is Adam? Because he's the guy that I've got to film. The talent. I've also got to film about the talent. I've got to get the two shot. So I sort of look behind me like this, and out of the corner of my eye, I see the safety diver, and she's got a big steel assegai, with like a big spear. Mm -hmm. And it had one end, it had a, um, a bolt head, so you could just poke things away. And on the other hand was the spear. Oh. She was coming down with the spear. The spear. So she knew something was So I thought, <laughs> oh, not right. I wonder what's wrong. And as I turned down <laughs> like this, the crocodile was just looking right, but looking at me, just like looking at me. And one of the things they said to me was, underwater, cr the crocodile's eyesight is not very good. It's got a nictating membrane. Mm. So when it goes underwater, it's, it's like a diving mask that goes over its eyes. Mm -hmm. It's got two eyebrows, two, two eye, it's like two eyelids, but they're, they're, so it has the one that completely covers it like we have, but then it has another one that comes oh, right. up like a diving mask. And as I looked at it, I could see its eyes just watching every move. And you only, and I brought the camera around slowly. You still tried to, to film. <laughs> no, I had oh, it side on. <laughs> I had it side on like a shield, and it, hit the, it just bit the camera. Oh, it it, and imagine then, if you didn't put that camera there. So and then, <laughs> it, I, but the, the, as I happened, I tried to force myself away from it because I was the current was pushing me onto it. And as I pushed myself away, I sort of came up, and then I went over the top of it, and then it bit the the, the light. One of the lights was on the left side. It bit that, and then it just swam off. So this is why the expert's not the expert anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so do you not get any chainmail protection or? No, the um, diving supervisor who didn't, didn't actually go on the job, he rang me up just before I went to Africa and he said, Michael, he said, I've got no worries about the diving. <laughs> he said, it's a river, you've got visibility. Yes, it's a fast current, but there's no problems with the, with the river. He said, what I have got an issue with is what you're filming. Um, and um, he said, they're totally unpredictable crocodiles. You know, I'll put it this way, I'd rather be in the water with a tiger shark, mm. a 12 foot tiger shark. Totally, I've been in the water with 12 foot tiger sharks, I've been in the water with big bull sharks, but they are not like crocodiles. Crocodiles are totally unpredictable, and they can go from zero to 50 miles an hour, just like that. Yeah. They just change. You think they're just sitting there quietly, they're not. And they're watching every move. But um, going back to the supervisor, he said to me, I said, well look Richie, because Ben Fogel's on the shoot, they are sending a full-on paramedic. Oh, no. Medical kit, everything. Just in case. Just in case there's a problem. <laughs> he says, Mike, you'll need more than a paramedic. He said, you'll need two bits of wood, a hammer and a nail. Oh, I no. said, what's that for? He said, the cross. <laughs> you dig your grave. <laughs> but the only person that got injured on that shoot was the paramedic. <laughs> he climbed into the boat one day, slipped, and ripped his foot. Oh. Yeah. So we had to patch him up. He's quite a big lad. So um, anyway, that was that. So yeah, there are other things. And, and I did a big shoot in the Amazon, on Amazon Abyss. Um, and I caught uh, Bill Hartzier, which is a river-born. Um, you get it from microscopic snails, which bore into your skin. And it's normally in stagnant water, you get it. Uh, Bill Hart's here is second to uh, malaria in, for killing people in the sort of third world. And um, I came back, and I, about six weeks after I got back, I started getting night sweats. I wake up in the mm. night completely sweating and um, getting weaker, like the flu, but yeah. getting weaker and weaker. And then I had a medical, I had a blood test. And they said, you've got Bill Hart's here, so. That's all we have time for, but I have okay. one last question. Yeah. What advice do you have for students who are interested in this profession? Um, it depends on what branch of the profession, you know, if you want to get into the film business, I'm sure you do. I mean, it's a wonderful profession to be in. Um, it's just the 
staying power. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a tough business to be in. I can't tell such you. Such competitive. It's so competitive. As well. So many people want to do it, and unlike when I first, the biggest barrier when I started was money. Mm -hmm. The actual Struggling cost of getting to get into the it. Money, yeah. Now that's not such a barrier mm. because the prices of cameras have come right down, and there's you so can many more people. Good sponsors as well from companies. Yes, uh, but if you find a subject, and you know, if you're passionate about film, and you have a, the best thing I ever did was made that film, the artificial reef. Because that led you on to your next because things. Yeah. A year of making a film, editing it, is worth and it. And learning by your mistakes, is better than any film school. Mm. It's, it's, it's the best way because once you start losing money you won't make those mistakes again I've made so many mistakes in my career at the beginning and still make mistakes you, you still you, you I learn still from them and you, but you learn from them exactly so uh, but it's, I can't think of a better profession to be in I really can't well thank you very much again it was a pleasure to talk to you today thank, thank you, you. Yeah, thank you for inviting me thank you